Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. Jonathan Rabin wrote about human landscapes rather than uninhabited ones, and the borderlands between what a place professes to be and what they are. An Englishman who emigrated to Seattle at the age of 47, his status as an outsider gave him a unique perspective on America as the land of perpetual self-reinvention. Many of his books involved water, and all contain interior as well as physical journeys. A writer of this magnitude couldn't be encapsulated by just one guest, so I've invited two. Readers of Jonathan Rabin will be familiar with his daughter Julia, who appeared in several of his books. We're joined by John Freeman, executive editor at the publisher Knopf and editor of Rabin's last book. We spoke about Rabin's fascination with sailing, the emigrant experience, and how he read landscape. Before we begin, I want to take 30 seconds to tell you about my new book. It's called A Sunny Place for Shady People, and it's about six years I spent on the island of Malta. It begins in the comic tradition of Redmond O'Hanlon or Bill Bryson with mishaps and clashes of culture, but it ends in a very dark place, much like my stay on the island. I watched an organized criminal network take over the government of a European Union member state with the widespread support of its citizens, and this culminated in the brutal car bomb assassination of a writer I admired, the investigative journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia. I set out to show why this could happen in a European Union member state, and why those behind it have gotten away with it. A Sunny Place for Shady People is available now from Trinity University Press and booksellers everywhere. I hope you'll check it out. And now, here's my conversation with Julia Rabin and John Freeman. So I'd like to start with you, John. You've described Jonathan Rabin as one of the best writers of geography to have ever lived in North America. Could you say more about that and give some context for those who don't know his work? Yeah, I think sometimes writers of geography of place uh, get that way because they're new to it. And that was certainly the case with um, Jonathan Rabin. Um, He traveled a lot in in the U.S. before he moved there. Uh, But he came with open eyes and open ears um, and a winning idea um, that he didn't know anything. Um, he didn't know as much as the land itself knew and that people who lived and traveled across the land knew. And the latter was a really winning quality for a, a writer who wrote of geography because it meant that in each one of his books, he would sort of attach himself to one or two or many people who knew the landscape and talk to them, travel with them. Um, and it made it, it instantly, I think, in, in his work, um, made a before and after. There was the Jonathan um, who wrote about sailing and um, Arabia and England. Um, uh, and then there was the, the Jonathan Raven who wrote after he came to North America and traveled down the Mississippi. Um, and he was, for lack of a better word, I think democratized by it. He was awed by it. He um, realized also as a, as a white Englishman that it was a it was a continent that had been settled by people like him, but that there were many many people there already, um, and that it had a huge multiracial history and culture. And from the the early to mid nineteen eighties onward, he sort of dedicated himself to seeing that, appreciating that, and and traveling with it. And you know, when you look back on the history of um, uh, of 20th century travel writing, you, you probably don't expect to turn to, <laughs> to uh, a, a white English guy from the kind of social class that he was from with the background that he had to think that you might have journeys that, that stand the test of time. But if you read Passage to Juno, if you read Badland, um, if you read Old Glory, th- they completely stand up. There's nothing in there that's embarrassing or or um, dated in the ways that we expect to be dated. Um, it's, it's really rather awesome. Yeah. It's incredible how contemporary some of those feel like old glory, especially it seems to just predict the current politics in such a great way. Um, so Julia, I, I won't ask you when you first encountered Jonathan Rabin, that would be a little bit odd, but uh, when, when did you first read one of your father's books? Do you remember? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I had, 
I'd read little bits and pieces, but I think the first time that I read one of his books in full was Wax Wings because I was let in on the process of him writing it. And so I would come home from school every day and he'd show me what paragraph he, or pages or chapter he wrote that day. And I'd read through every day and he'd ask me what I thought. And so um, I became very invested in Wax Wings. And that was the first one that I not only got to read from start to finish, but got to read from start to finish as he was writing it. <laughs> That's really interesting. And he describes, um, he wrote on a typewriter. Is that is that right? Yeah. Like he talked about, I, I think I saw an interview where he said he um, he found the, the mechanics of the typewriter improved people's prose style because the necessity of typing through the entire page to get to the change you wanted to make um, revealed that you want to change all these other things on the way through. And he felt that the word processors or computers weren't the same because you can change things in an instant. You don't do that same uh, laborious going over and over. I think it was Badlands was his first one that he wrote partially on the computer. I could be wrong about that, but he did He did eventually start using the computer at the pressuring of all, all of the people involved in producing his books. But um <laughs> He, he was a big advocate of the typewriter, and it also worked really well with his, his procedure for writing, which was not to write quickly, because what he, what he told me about writer's block and about planning and about creating, creating a book was that if you tried to plan too far ahead without actually writing it, you would find yourself stuck, and that's where people would really get blocked, is if they, if they went too far without building that solid foundation of the actual writing so he would write it sentence by sentence and do it in a way that really needed very little editing um because he did it so meticulously as he was crafting it and then if he found himself not knowing where to go he would go backwards and delete delete what he'd written previously because he knew that something in there had sort of stopped him up and that um having it be free-flowing was an indication that it was going in the right direction so um the, the slowness of the typewriter and the intentionality of having to put it on the page and keep it on the page exactly as it is worked really well for him. Yeah. So John, you've, you've edited Jonathan's work and you described your, I think it was your first meeting with him in an article, I believe that was published last year. And you said that his house was different from any that you had encountered. And the overwhelming impression was of a place whose views were equally outward and inward facing, much like his books. So like Bad Land, Passage to Juno, Old Glory, some of the books we just referred to, they're all interior journeys as well as physical ones and chronicles of shifting frontiers. Could you guys say something about that? Yeah, the um, the travel journey, which now is, I, I think, almost um, thought of as inherently inward, um, was something that he perfected in, in in over the course of his lifetime, and that I think travelers before had always done that to some degree. But it's become a, a modern trope of travel writing that that as you're moving through the world, you're it's imprinting itself upon you and eliciting responses from what, whatever period of your life you're going through. Um, and I think you know when I went to um, his house um, uh, and. I met Julia for the first time. Um, I, I had this impression that Jonathan would be this sort of august figure surrounded with laurels, overflowing um, ashtrays, and um, a, a, an enormous library. Because of, of, if you read a Jonathan Raven book, you learn quite a bit. Um, he was an, an amazing um, swatter up. Uh, on almost anything he was interested in. And so you can re read about Tlingit Indian um, weaving patterns while reading about the ocean and uh, passage to Juno. And you can read about, um, you know, the newspapers which called people to Montana and elsewhere um, in Badlands. Um, and he did all this by doing research. And so I pictured him in this kind of... Um, uh, Tower of Babel, um, when in fact it was just a, a tall, several-story house um, with a study, but not an overwhelming amount of books. Um, and um, because he had had a, a, the stroke at that point, um, my first impression was that it was an incredibly impractical house for some of with some mobility issues. And yet he determined to live in it um, 
And he did so with an enormous amount of dignity and um, happiness, it seemed. He seemed utterly happy there. Um, and, uh, you know, when you meet a traveler who has had to stop traveling, you expect gloominess and melancholy and self-pity. And perhaps he had some of those things, but he certainly wasn't wearing those garments the day that I met him. Um, he was cosmopolitan, funny. It was as if the world was still entirely open to him. And he just happened to be stirring the curry, which um, Julia was helping him make with uh, with one hand rather than two. But I read that he had no interest in traveling until a stage play that he wrote, The Sunset Touch, premiered at the Old Vic in 77 to bad reviews and an assignment um, for to write for a TV show. I think it was Freya Stark on Iraq had sent him abroad and that this kind of revealed the usefulness of um, travel for a writer. And his first uh, travel book, Arabia, followed soon after that. So was that true? Was He wasn't a traveler before this? I mean, I know just from the bi- bibliography, Julia can probably say more, but that, yeah, that is his first travel book. And it, it's an unlikely one because it, it, his father had gone to the Middle East um, when he was stationed there um, during World War II, when he was um, stationed in Palestine and across North Africa. Um, but that he wouldn't really write into that experience until the very end of his life when he wrote Father and Son. Did he, did he ever talk to you about it, Julia? About traveling before Arabia? Not so much. Yeah, I, I think that was. I I ha- hadn't thought of that as the catalyst that pushed him into being interested in travel writing, the, the failed stage play until I read that as well. But um, it, it fits the timeline and it. uh yeah, my impression is that he was really focused on on reading and writing up until that point, but not necessarily applying that to travel. It's interesting, too, that that was, despite the importance of journeys for his work, I think Arabia is the only straight travel book that he wrote. I mean, the mm-hmm. other ones are, are much more than, than simple travel narratives. And the, he rejected the uh, label of travel writer like many people do, but he, he did win the Thomas Cook Award twice. And only one other person did that. That, that was for... Um, I think Old Glory in 81 and then uh, Hunting Mr. Heartbreak, which is one of my favorites. I love that book too. I, I wish, I, I wish, I mean, for many reasons, and um, Julie has many, many more certainly, but I, I wish um, Jonathan Rabin was around now because I would love for him to travel America now yeah. and, and t- to report back because there's Hunting Mr. Heartbreak was, was such a perfect kind of book of checking in on a big, big country, traveling around it and, telling you stories and and it, it was a way of testing t- taking the pulse of a place and he had obviously done that in coasting um with a much smaller country and so, so to come to a, a nation as big as the united states and then to think you know what I, i'm gonna do it but i'm gonna do it in a freighter <laughs> um it, it's just it, it's it's almost comically ambitious but also it because it's him it, it's all it, it proceeds um, with a kind of shaggy um, actual humility in the face of of the project itself, and that that I I still believe that kind of book can be written, but you need a very special character person um, who's open to so many different trade winds when, once traveling. That I, I think it's only once a generation that we'll get a book like that. Yeah, it's, I read somewhere that he said Hunting Mr. Heartbreak is infused with a giddy sense of arrival. And it took two more books, Badland and Passage to Juno, to understand that the sense of, of arrival was illusory. So it seemed like he was constantly digging into this emigrant mindset. And uh, did did you think, do you feel like he, um, did he ever reach a place where he felt he understood the place he was living in? Or was he always someone searching for understanding while casting kind of a backward glance at the world he came from? I think he intentionally didn't try not to get to the level of, I mean, not, I think nobody can fully understand a place all the way down to its bones and know everything about it. But I think that he, he knew that one of his advantages was being an outsider and being an immigrant. And he held on to his British citizenship very strongly because of that. Never became an American citizen, Mm -hmm. even though he lived here for a long time decades um and he saw that as an asset in in his writing and um i think that that maintaining that status helped him have that kind of sense of curiosity and wonder and also detachment from feeling responsible for it for being able to kind of like yeah. 
float around and collect the information and to um, report back on it without owning it in that possessive kind of way. Yeah, that's really interesting to you could be an observer, but you're, you, he is part of the culture, but he's not. So he's an outsider with the eyes of an insider to some extent. That's really interesting. And he's. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems to me that um, the sense of being an outsider seemed to be a deeper part of his personality. Like he, I read an interview where he said, from the moment I went to boarding school, aged 11, and maybe before that, I felt myself tarred with the brush of outsiderdom. And it helps you see the world more, with more clarity than you'd have if you were fully immersed in it and part of it. And, and some of that comes up in father and son too, that sense of of uh, being an outsider. I sort of wonder if, um, Julia, you could probably add to this, if some of that is a, res- a residue of the British class system, um, which makes outsiders mm-hmm. of just pretty much everybody except for maybe um, the very, very few who have utter um, confidence that they are, that are of the class that they find themselves in. Um, and I think Jonathan Rabin, because he went to a, a posher boarding school than his family came from, I think was always, um, and he was writing about this in, in a, in a, as in a book he never finished, um, that he was always aware that he was, he was not quite of the class that had educated him, um, that he had spent time around. And, and he used to joke in the most amusing ways. Um, there's a very funny exchange with a person who sort of trolled him on Twitter for his voice and Jonathan wrote this email back to him that, that essentially said, every time I open my mouth, I'm, I'm sort of I'm, I'm amazed and appalled and amused by the voice that comes out of it. And he had this <laughs> beautiful speaking voice. He spoke in complete sentences and paragraphs. Um, you could almost transcribe him as he spoke. Um, and that was a, a, a result of the schooling that he had come through. But that was not who he was. Um, and so there were parts of him. He always had a buttoned up shirt when I saw him in, in Seattle, um, you know, which given given the stroke was probably would have been a difficult thing for him to do. But he was always turned out. Um, he had he always wanted to have a meal. We didn't sit there and eat sandwiches on our lap. We had lunch um, and we had a conversation and we didn't talk about the book while we did it. And so he was in, among many other things. He possessed beautiful manners. He wrote thank you letters. Um, he asked after family. Um, you know, I, I, I'm one of many people who had the luck of working on his books, including Gary Fiskajohn, who was a close friend of his, Christopher McLehose, who was also a close friend. They worked on the majority of Jonathan's books. But among writers, it's very unusual for someone to ask you as many questions <laughs> as you ask them, um, because they are usually at the end of a, a very long and painful and stressful and exposing, vulnerable-making task. And so it's uh, a delicate task the editor has of coming in and, and basically finishing the job and making them feel happy. But within that, Jonathan was supremely humane um, and outward looking. And that was just very unusual. I really agree with that. And I think the, that humane outward looking side of him is so tied up with why he was so drawn to America and so rebelling against the British class system, where even if he felt like he had been accepted within his social class, which he didn't, but if he had, then he still would have felt bound by the social structure that sort of said, well, that's where you stay and that's who you interact with. And that's, that's your domain. And he, his curiosity towards everybody not just people who he felt were in that social bubble that had been designated for him um i think was one of the things that he found so interesting about america and so um alluring about it that's interesting in passage to juno he said um america as the land of perpetual self-reinvention has all, had always been my theme so th- mm-hmm. that really speaks to what you just said about the class system and i wonder if he understood americans um because he understood the emigrant mindset like that, that was seemed to be a common interest, right? From Arabia, the people he hung out with in, in Arabia um, tended to be people who were working there, transient workers and migrant laborers. And then hunting Mr. Heartbreak, I mean, he, he went all over the place looking at the, the American immigrant experience from, from, from the perspective of even taking the boat across to, to get the sense of what it must have been like to uh, arrive on those shores by sea, as so many others did. And then, you know, Badlands as well. It's a, do you think he grasped, he seemed to grasp that so well because he understood that emigrant mindset? Like, I mean, he was one himself, 
I think so. And yeah, even in Wax Wings with um, the storyline with Chick, the immigrant who comes from China in a storage container, he he was really loved exploring the all the different narratives of immigration and of um, breaking out of boxes in that kind of way. Hmm. So his other great theme um, was water. So many of his books involve water, like Coasting, The Waters of the UK, um, Old Glory about the Mississippi. Passage to Juno, the West Coast, and the Inside Passage, and many of the pieces collected in Driving Home as well. But even when he's on dry land, he was often writing about sea-like landscapes, like in Badland. So, what was it about the nautical that interested him so deeply? Do you want to do you want to answer that, Julia? Because you actually spent time on the boat with him. Well, I think he was really interested in the nautical, but he was also just interested in in place and in landscape, and I think maybe the landscape of the ocean and the ocean itself being this constantly changing, unpinnable, kind of terrifying. He liked things that were a little scary, you know, he was drawn to things that were a little bit unsettling sometimes. And that, um, put someone in the state of openness and curiosity and tension and anxiety and all of the emotions, both positive and negative that, um, are just so central to the human condition that like the ocean was kind of just the perfect landscape that could, that was present everywhere and water in general too. I mean, rivers and um, just the same and the, the changing nature that you can stay with the river, but it will never stay the same. Yeah. And there's something terrifying too about those wide open spaces in the center of America, I guess. These just these vast skies and a and a landscape that makes you feel so small. So you mm-hmm. you went with your father on a on a few of these small boat trips. I mean, I know you're quite young, but what was shipboard life like? I mean, I always imagined like a sort of floating library with a box of wine and a curry on the stove. That's exactly a great image, yeah. <laughs> um curry on the stove, spaghetti bolognese. Um, definitely the, the library, you know, uh, if it got, the water got too choppy, we would have to kind of like hold the books in the shelves. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience. I'm trying to think of how to sum it up, but, um, he loved to try and prioritize sailing with the sails over using the engine, of course, because, um, you know, engaging with the weather and with the wind and also just the quiet of using the sails and propelling that way. Um, we'd wake up pretty early. He'd always make, he was a great cook of all things and would make breakfast and then we'd get on our way and he would have his map and all of his instruments that I can't even list all of them. He would have me sometimes practice trying to use the charts and to make plans and read all of the different, um, different instruments, but often would, uh, let me sit with my book either on the deck and, or in the cabin, depending on the weather and, um, get as far as we felt like going, find a place to moor. We had a little dinghy that we would take to land. If we ended up by a nice town that he wanted to go try the restaurant or whatever. Um, or we would sit, in the boat and Scrabble was the big after dinner pastime. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense for a writer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> John, there's a really interesting quote uh, from your article. You said nations all contain borderlands and Jonathan loved moving around in them, not just the boundary between the coast and the sea, but between suburbs and forests, between their past and present, between what they profess to be and what they are. He was a genius at inhabiting those spaces. That is really interesting. What they between what they profess to be and what they are. Could you say something more about that? Yeah, I think this begins with his sense of outsidership and what he um, believed uh, it allowed him to do. Um, you know, the coasting sounds like a Thomas Cook travel award winning, ready off the shelf British travel book on on the surface. But when you follow him along it, um, it's someone who's really squinting at. Um, British life in the 1970s, um, getting as far away from it as possible to see if he can reassemble it and make sense of it. Um, And, you know, at the time, this is someone who was friends with Ian McEwen and teaching at the University of East Anglia, who had a regular gig in um, 
you know, some of the best and most widely distributed British publications, um, who was friends with Robert Lowell and lived in a kind of nice part of, of London. You would never know that he was, was that thing, but he was also this person who was kind of squinting at the society in which he was, was in. And I think um, there was something about Jonathan Rabin that he was like this um, extremely rational cosmic sensualist um, who had an appreciation for the, this vast mystery of the world that we're in. And that was always overarching, I think, everything he wrote, uh, that he was always in some ways touching it, but not in a woo-woo way, but in a rather um, almost existential way. Uh, for someone who was, I think, pretty much as an atheist, who, he, he had a, a, a deep and abiding respect for the mysteries of the world that we're in. And the biggest ones that seemed to touch him the most were the 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 the, the way the, the way that the natural world um, kind of overlapped with the civilizations that we built there are two forms of complexity and patterning um, and it, and one of the things that's often I think overlooked a little bit about him is he was one of the best prose writers of his time in any genre and so when, when you have these two very complex systems, the natural world, the ocean and its habitat and the, the, the wildlife that's there, and then the built environment, which is also part of nature interacting, you have this really rich um, descriptive field uh, because you have two, two um, forces which are not opposing each other, but which we have defined our civilization often as being in opposition or control of the other as in nature. And so I think what, what Jonathan was really good at doing was, was allowing um, the overlap to be an open question, you know, and to sort of suggest, like, I think some of the best writers of geography of the 20th century, like Gary Snyder or Barry Lopez or Annie Dillard, that this civilization that we built is uh, that, that humans have built over time is at once much older and much flimsier than we think. And the, the perfect metaphor for that is traveling around it in a little boat, you know? And from the very beginning when he wrote Coasting, I, I think at some, when he first gets a boat, it's like one of those really bullshit tiny dinghies that you, you can so, sail around Hyde Park. And he's with a friend who's like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, why are you getting in this boat? And it's not long after that that he gets in another boat that's just big enough to sail off the coast of England. And what Julie was saying about him liking to be terrified, I, he must have because he so clearly wasn't skilled enough to take the journey, but he decided to do it because it felt like something he had to do. And, and the, the, whatever compulsion that dr drove him out there, it allowed him to see that, that strange and, and constant overlap between the world that is and the world that that humans build. I read that he learned to sail in three weeks from a retired, retired Naval officer. And that includes learning the sextant and navigating the sextant. That's amazing. I don't know. I'm curious, Julia, if, if he was always learning new skills because he loved, he seemed to so much love learning things and facts. If you provided him with a new fact, it was like the, the gift of the day. Um, so he also liked gossip, <laughs> um, which was sort of a soft fact. But I, was he always learning new ways to to do things? Absolutely. And I, I think he really, went, I mean, he was humble in most imaginable ways, but especially with his um, capacity for math and science, I think he really downplayed that and sort of said, oh, that's that's not really my thing, but it absolutely was. And he was fascinated by that as well. And I think that his ability to grasp the use of the sextant and all of the navigational tools are a testament to the type of brain that he had, which was really open-ended and really expansive and really hungry for everything and anything. Um, so he was definitely always learning new things and was always delighted by by anything that um, he felt, yeah, little tidbits that you could bring him that he felt, oh, yes, that's a new thing <laughs> can learn. Yeah, you guys brought up uh, two things that I'd like to dig into a bit more. 
uh, one was his lens on landscape. In driving home, he he writes about reading landscape. He says every inhabited landscape is a palimpsest. Its original parchment nearly blackened with the cross hatchings of successive generations of authors claiming the place as their own, imposing their designs on it. And he talks about learning to see, uh, learning to to read it as a landscape historian. How much uh, of an influence did his being British, growing up in a place where every scrap of land is owned for countless generations, have in shaping that view? Because he he really had a an incredible ability to. Um, Peel those sorts of stories from the land. Badlands is my favorite example. That's a completely fascinating book about a place that doesn't seem like it would be interesting. I'm glad you brought that quote because I was just pulling it up on that piece up on my phone. It's one of my favorites, Second Nature from Granta, because of his descriptions of yeah the the way that the bombed out shells of buildings from World War II were like the nature ideals of his childhood. Um, and the way, yeah, the, the way that he saw the contrast between the nature in England and the, the influence that people had had on it versus the nature in the United States and the West Coast, especially where it was, as he put it, like verging on going back into wilderness at any moment. The impressions that the humans had left on it were not irreversible in the way that they were in, in England. Yeah, to, you're reading some of that stuff, it reminded me of you know, camping in, in my hometown area and these behind my friend's farmhouse and you'd find these old piles of tin cans or the old foundation of a schoolhouse. And it, it makes you realize there was once somebody else had lived in this place. There were stories buried here that probably nobody living remembers them anymore. And he had Badlands was such a mm-hmm. great example of digging into these stories and pulling up uh, right back to the the newspapers that that attracted these immigrants in the first place. Really, such a, a great book and one of my favorites, I think. Uh, you, you also mentioned um, that he was a man of many friends. Paul Theroux said whenever he found a book he liked, he formed a friendship with the writer. Could you say more about that? So who, who were some of the people who, who he, he reached out to in that way? Well, there are so many, and I don't know the problem sometimes is I don't know who reached out to who first. I don't know how it formed, but obviously he was also very receptive to people who who reached out to him. and. Um, was really generous with his reading and with his teaching and engaging with people um, who, you know, somebody would write an article about him or not even an article, somebody would write a blog post about him. And if he saw something in it that he loved, he would reach out to them and let them know and engage with them and um, made many friends that way. Um, And I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it was similar to, how he saw writers who were even long dead like he even if he couldn't actually communicate with them and build a a worldly friendship he he felt that friendship and that kinship just from reading their books and sort of strove to do the same with his own writing where where people felt that they became friends with him just by reading him as well so he, he met philip larkin when he was a student in hull how important was that meeting and and uh larkin's work for his own writing do you think because I mean, Larkin quotes come up peppered throughout throughout his books. Mm-hmm. He always used to recite "They fuck you up, your mom and dad" to me. <laughs> that's great. That's, fine. that's a great one. <laughs> no, I think it was hugely important. He had a, a a for someone who wrote prose his whole life. He had a a, a long and um, constant appreciation for poetry, uh, and was reading poetry written recently, as well as uh, you know the p- poets that he grew up with. And that I think it was just part of his love of language in general and the English language particularly. Uh, and, you know, in the study, there was, there were books of, um, he edited the Oxford, what is it? The Oxford book of the sea, mm-hmm. um, which has poetry in it. And, you know, the, you can't really write about the sea without dealing with Coleridge and, um, you know, many other uh, seafaring poets. And I, I think that's very unusual in our time. Um, for someone to be that committed to writing prose, but that committed to also c- continuously reading poetry. And I, I think um, Larkin obviously um, had a particular resonance, as did Lowell, who he knew much you know, really well. Um, but there were, it, there were others that um, he talked about. And, you know, he wasn't, as, as I could tell, friends necessarily with poets in the same way that he was friends with novelists, including ones who had written about him, like um, John Raymond and um, 
uh, he he had been Ian McEwan's teacher, I believe, which is how they met um, uh, at uh, East Anglia. Um, and McEwan has talked about, you know, what it was like to have Rabin as a, Jonathan Rabin as a kind of spectacle of a spec um, example of what literary life was. You know, sort of urbane was you know odd jobbing, um, able to do many different things. Uh, because the the first book that I think would probably would have come out that McEwen would have been very aware of, was aware of which has never been published in the U.S. is this book Soft City. Yeah, yeah, which is a kind of miraculous nonfiction, creative nonfiction book about about, about city life. Um, and you know, if, if it were published today with with a few changes, it would be very of the moment. Um, and I, I think you can't write the way he did with the kind of music in his prose without having a, a deep appreciation of, of poetry, mm. a kind of respect for the sonics of it. And, and yet you never, you never would read a Rabin page and say, you know, this is poetical prose. I think that would probably have made him vomit, um, you know, cause he also was unsentimental about his writing as he wanted it to be lucid and clear and um, lovely and specific and editing him was a joy because um, he knew exactly what he wanted his sentences to do. You know, they were, they were every single element of them, every colon, every adjective, every noun, they were all put into place on purpose. Um, and it, it was, it was the opposite of hack work. And you pointed out too, that he's, um, he's someone who tried his pen at many forms. That's uh, it's easy to um, forget about that when you were talking about some of the travel books or travel like books, you know, he's wrote fiction as well. Um, plays quite, quite a number, not just that first one that I, the one that I mentioned and then the soft city, that's quite, it's such an interesting book. Um, mm -hmm. he, he wanted to, he said somewhere, I'd like to think there's still life uh, left in the notion of the writer. Who's just a writer, you know, not a, a pigeonhole in a particular genre. So can you say something about his fiction? For those who haven't read it, he was sort of writing. I don't know, Julia. You should ju jump in here because you watched him write it. But he was sort of writing a Northwest trilogy mm -hmm. um, that was very much connected to plays. Um, but all the things I think um, that that you that you think of as being attached to a Jonathan Rabin novel, I'm uh, sorry, book of of nonfiction, was, which is that sort of um, that immense intelligence and informational guide they they're, they're they're paired back in the novels the novels really are about interior life and and interactions between people and places and they're i would say they're especially wax wings um they're there's a comedic element to them an absurdity about life that he fully appreciated which i think if you play up too much as a travel writer you end up being bumptious but whereas in in his fiction it ends up feeling um intensely amusing and um and and i don't want to say joyful because i think he would come smack me in the face for that that word but there there was something um deeply forgiving to the human animal in the fiction and how did he respond to criticism julia you'll remember i um sadly by the time um father and son was out he was no longer with us so i i didn't get the chance to share the amazing reviews he got right. with him which i think would have made him happy but I, I, I don't know what the bad reviews would have done. I know. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, it was interesting because sometimes, even with a good review, if he felt that they were, he was being praised for reasons that weren't valid, he could find a way to be upset with a good review, too. But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, but I don't, it's, it's hard to say because I think that there are some things that he he would just easily let roll off his back and say, "Oh well, they they're just not even close to getting it, and that's fine." Um, but I think that also, sort of, with the way that he engaged in the world and the the kind of vulnerability that he put on display in his writing and in his thinking, there there was something essentially kind of soft bellied about him, sort of, you know, <laughs> about. It, just being able to earnestly engage with the world and to engage with people, you sort of have to be able to be hurt. And I think that that was true of him as well. And we mentioned father and son several times. Um, could you tell us about that for those who haven't read it? I mean, 
it's it's really an astonishing book like you, you know when a, a writer gets a bit older and you're it's somebody whose who's work you've loved and read for years and then you pick up sort of one of these books of your later years and think oh i don't know like is this gonna hold up to the to the writer in his prime part of you is sort of hoping for the sort of read that you're used to and part of you is kind of anticipating that uh, maybe it won't be up to snuff but this was a writer at the top of his form like it was such a good book so could you could you give us a sense first of all of uh, what it was about for those who haven't read it yet do you want to summarize it julia or should i <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to go ahead with that <laughs> basically uh it was this a, a story on two tracks of a father and son, um, both trying to get home across a distance of 70 years. Uh, Jonathan's father uh, w- fought in World War II, was sunk at Dunkirk, fought at Anzio, was um, cons- sent to Palestine um, and fought and was stationed in North Africa and was away from home for several years at the beginning of his marriage and wrote letters home to Jonathan's mother. Um, and uh Jonathan was rereading these letters as he went into hospital after having a, a stroke, um, uh, which put him into a, a bed and he, from which he never really stood up from. Um, uh, he lost the use of most of one arm and, um, and his legs, and, and yet he was still fully, totally present. Um, and so the book is told in two tracks, him having the stroke and going into hospital sp- and spending the rest of the book trying to get home and coming to grips with this new territory, this new territory of, of being unwell and being considered to be unwell. And the, and the second track is his father going off to war um, in this new territory, which is everywhere outside of England. He had never left England at that time. And he's also entering the new territory of marriage because um, he's been, he's gotten married along the way and he's about to become a father at the end of the book. And so the book twines those two journeys together. And it's really a story of two men who were formed by three institutions. The, British class system, um, uh, uh, the, the military, and the church. Um, and it's a story of how they were each formed very differently by those institutions um, and how at the, you know, in times of extremists, they, th- those backgrounds um, reared themselves up in different ways for each of them. Why the church for those who don't know? Well, his father was a vicar. Um, is that the right word, um, Julia? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, in, a, in a small village. Um, and so the, the journey for, for his father into the war and coming home is also a, a, to, to a small degree, a journey of faith, of like a life that he, he loved musical theater. He had this um, life buying, strangely enough, um, fancy underwear in, in war zones, <laughs> which I didn't know was part of World War II. But he's constantly writing home to Julia's um, grandmother. Right, it was your grandmother. Uh, yeah. I bought you some undies in this town in Italy, and I, I'm thinking this is not in the the um, you know the Steven Spielberg adaptations of World War II films, um, and it uh, and that was the case because he was um, he was from the class from which she was in, and uh, the, the the British Army during World War II was very much a class system. So he had essentially a servant who dug his trenches. Um, and mail was shipped off twice a day. It's, and even on train trips around Britain, um, uh, the, the, the officers and the, the soldiers and everyone else would travel in different classes on the trains. And you would think that it, and, and in an apocalyptic time, those type, type of boundaries would break down. But in fact, they were, they were enforced more rigorously than, than ever. And Jonathan's sort of writing about that as as England is entering about to enter the post war period, and some of those those boundaries will be broken down a tiny bit by the rise of a more emphatic and um, bureaucratic um, welfare state. Meanwhile, he's in the United States seventy years later in a in a hospital um, with his posh accent, but you know with um, mo- many many people who are there as immigrants working in the hospital um, and in. And encountering the class system of a hospital, which is at the, at the very top are the, the administrators, the very neck below them are the doctors, below them are the nurses, and at the very, very, very bottom are the unwell. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, he's feeling echoes of his experience um, in boarding school. Um, and and you know, that's how miserable boarding school was to him. 
And so it, on top of everything, these juxtapositions are um, surprisingly incredibly comic. Um, I don't think I would ever, I'd ever uh, come across someone who, who's found their own catastrophic stroke and it's experienced so funny. It was incredible. It, um, it, those are the parts of the book that really uh, stuck in my mind, his descriptions of being a patient and the frustration of, at feeling helpless and, and not just feeling helpless, but being talked down to. You know, those that really makes you think about how you look at, uh, at older people or uh, the sense that he, he was completely sharp, he's reading all the time, and these people just talk to him like a baby. You know, I, I could understand how that would infuriate you. Yeah, he's reading, he's reading Tony Judd's massive 900 page um, post war history, post war in, in the hospital on his Kindle. Um, well, people then he's interrupted some nights by someone coming in and say, Do you want a poopy? And it's, I mean, his his timing, his comedic timing throughout it all is great, but even more so is is his um, his uh, very British sanguinity in the face of <laughs> in the face of this is is um, is pretty remarkable. And he he also writes about when he writes about ringing in the rehabilitation center. He's he says um, his mood was one of high elation, and that it's sometimes a side effect of of strokes. And when he talked to distant friends on the phone, they seemed surprised by his good humor, just just as you were. Um, is was that so different from his normal personality? Julie, you should jump in here because one of the most affecting parts of the book is when he's he suddenly realizes that he's not putting as cheerful a face on it as 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 he thinks he is, and he's also noticing that you're putting a cheerful face on seeing him in that state. Yeah. No, and I think I think strokes have a profound influence on on personality and demeanor and both the short term and the long term. For him, I didn't I didn't necessarily see that he got more cheerful from the stroke. I think that in some ways, I mean, it was just a whole another whole layer of learning for him to go through in being in this position, being the patient, being in this position of really real powerlessness, which, you know, for him as somebody who was always on his feet and was always able to be in control of his own destiny and really prided himself on that and really prioritized that in his life, having to just kind of throw up his hands and say like, well, I'm not in control of this. I am just along for the ride. I think that he, people were, were surprised at how well he adapted to that and what good humor he had about it. Um, I would say actually in the immediate months after the stroke, it made his, his demeanor was less happy than both Mm -hmm. before the stroke and in what, after he had a chance to recover more. Um, But I think that his adaptability and I think just his being really accustomed to laughing in the face of terror and laughing in the face of absurdity and confusion and um, being willing to deal with, yeah, as I forget exactly what your phrase was, the cosmic um, existentialism, the, his his willingness to engage with that was kind of, um, I think, primed him well for being able to throw up his hands and, and laugh in a lot of situations. I saw an interview also where he talked about seeing personal setbacks as material. He said, you're given these catastrophes and they're mm-hmm. gifts. Like, like your father dies, your wife leaves you all in a couple of months. That was, but there was a bit of him thinking, God, this is going to be good for the book. I mean, I, I can't imagine thinking that in this instance, but Jesus, did he ever produce a great book from it? been a long time writing it. it, it um, when, when I started to work with him, uh, Julia had been, um, you know, he was writing this partially through voice recognition software, um, very lo- uh, laboriously on a computer, um, which made editing, I think, uh, mind bogglingly difficult, but he still managed to produce the exact same rich basso profundo <laughs> tone to his writing, the same um, sort of felicitations in it, the, the same musicality. And typically with writers who switch to um, dictation, um, Henry James being one of them, um, you get this bloviating um, sort of s- spread um, and 
you know, it was the same thing with William Dean Howells, who tried dictating books in the late, either late 19th, or early 20th century. And Jonathan being Jonathan studied those authors and the mistakes they had made and made sure he himself did not make them. Um, and so the, the, the book that came out of this experience was um, something that was highly self-conscious of the pitfalls of its own creation and yet never um, burnished with the kind of self-regarding narcissism of, of a kind of metafictional device. It simply wanted to talk to you, um, but it was definitely made in, in, um, with close study of the ways that it could have fallen apart. It's interesting. And the structure was also really interesting. Like the two narratives that you described, they kind of weave weave around each other decades apart, but they never they never quite meet. Like was that um was that a way of representing his relationship with his father in a sense? Yes. I asked him <laughs> when I I don't know if you remember this, Julia, when I went to his when I went to go see him the first time and I had read this was part of a very, very long manuscript, which was essentially two books, and I I I briefly thought it's possible that there could be one book about the stroke alone um, and, and he could go straight through, but it would, it would basically uncouple that part of his, of, of his life from his father um, entirely. And um, he, he said, I would, <laughs> he made very clear that that was not an option, that the structure was there on purpose. Um, and uh, the, in the course of editing, he added a, one section um, in which there was a kind of bridge in which he went back to the moment of his father's death, where he was sort of strung out on the bed, sort of almost in the position of Jesus Christ. And, um, but he did not want to create an artificial um, coming together, one that he never himself truly experienced. He wanted it to be separate and parallel um, and, and let that parallelism do the work. And, um, I have to say, it was, it, I really admired him for sticking to his guns for that, because I think in, in, it was absolutely the right decision. Yeah. And I think he trusted the reader a lot, too, in in making that decision and and went out on a sort of limb saying, even, even if not everyone's going to understand it immediately or fully comprehend it, I trust that, that people will be able to get there and will be able to to see why I'm doing this, because I think he generally erred on the side of um, not, he didn't like to beat people over the head with his writing, you know, and with his conclusions and with where he came to. He didn't he didn't like to, he liked to be able to piece it together for them, for them to come away with something of their own. And you can really see it in the reviews, too. Everybody's saying that it's about something different. You know, <laughs> everyone's taking away a different central central piece and it's that's part of the beauty of it i think so john i know you have to to cut out here in a second so julia i'd like to give the last word to you um your relationship with your father and his with you sounds very different from from the one that we just described in father and son and watching it develop was an enjoyable aspect of his later books Uh, what was it like to grow up in those pages to grow up in those pages yeah oh um I mean, it's interesting seeing myself and them growing up with him as a father was, I mean, incredible. Um, he was really so, so far away from the, what he describes his relationship with his own father to be, even though they were, they grew to really have a kind of mutual understanding and appreciation for each other in later life. You know, he really, um, the way that he was really generous with me as a child and with other children in general too, being able to engage with us on on our level, but also kind of challenging us to to rise up and to meet him and to see see what we were capable of and see where we could meet him. Um, seeing myself in the pages is just really funny, mostly. Um, I think that he he writes so well about it. And I mean, it's almost like I I didn't get to see my childhood from the perspective that he writes about it. It's a whole other layer of my childhood that I get to see from from his eyes through his writing. Um, but definitely, definitely beautiful and poetic and fascinating. 
I think that's a great place to end. I mean, we could talk about these books for hours. It's, it's such a wonderful body of work. So thank you guys for sharing your insights with us today and for give, giving us a glimpse of the writer behind some of the finest writing of his generation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I loved it. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated. 